Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Blight, the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition here at Yale. Uh, a warm welcome to all of our online guests. Uh, welcome back. Uh, fall of 23, our brown bag lunch, our GLC at lunch series, what we used to call the brown bag series, uh, is meeting once again in person, but also hybrid and online. Uh, the room has our visiting fellows here. I uh, wish I, we could shine the camera and introduce all of them and other guests who have just arrived. Um, but today's talks by uh, Eric Hirschstahl. Um, and by the way, we will have a series of these almost every week throughout the fall by our visiting fellows and others. So stay tuned. You're all, if you're not on our mailing list, you should be. Uh, let us know. Uh, we're very pleased to have Eric here. Eric's uh, a professor of history at University of Utah. Uh, his research focuses on slavery, climate, and science in the early United States and the broader Atlantic. Uh, his first book, and I want to say a word about this because it was very useful to me and to lots of us working on the Yale and Slavery Project in the last couple of years, it's called The Science of Abolition, How Slaveholders Became the Enemies of Progress. It, it was not only useful in showing how abolitionists put science to work, but it also had some wonderful material on Benjamin Silliman, <laughs> uh, a, a very key figure in the history of scientific education here at Yale. Um, that was published by Yale Press in 2021. Um, his newest book is which which he will discuss today and by this title, uh, Carbon Conscripts, Slavery and the Origins of Climate Change, investigates racial slavery's role in the origins of climate change. And if any of you are either skeptics on climate change or skeptics on that claim in the title, uh, stay with us for the next half hour. Uh, Eric has uh, a distinguished career as a writer published in numerous scholarly journals, many important ones. But he also had a career as a journalist and wrote for the New Republic, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the Washington Post, et cetera. Eric is here on a one-month fellowship. We wish it was longer. But uh, without further ado, Eric Hirschthal, all yours. Some of us, by the way, are eating our lunch here, <laughs> so pardon us. We hope you're eating lunch out there, too. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so thank you, everybody uh, who's obviously uh, in attendance, but also uh, everyone who's out online. I hear that there's a, a, a pretty decent online turnout. Um, as uh, Professor Blight just said, thank you for the uh, uh, comments, for the kind words. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about my current research project, which is very much in its beginnings. Um, so uh, in a way, that's good. This should be understood as a talk. Uh, and a sort of a, a preview of the approach um, that I'm currently taking and some of my early findings rather than a summation of a book that is imminent, imminent, imminently being published. Um, I have one of seven chapters written and the kind of core data for the remaining three. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about as I go through this pro as I go through this talk. So as uh, Professor Blight mentioned, the project, uh, book project is tentatively titled Carbon Conscripts, Slavery and the Origins of Climate Change. Um, and in today's talk, I will give you a very, um, um, I hope, succinct blow by blow of what is my research question? Um, how am I approaching this very enormous topic? Uh, what are my main historiographic interventions? Uh, what are some of my core initial tentative arguments? Uh, what are my methods and sources, which is quite important given uh, the way that I'm approaching this question. And then the second half of the talk, if I'm being good with time, will be uh, a couple of the major findings based off of this kind of carbon emissions approach, approach that I've been taking, and then walking you through the commodity-based approach. That is to say, emissions for different slave-grown and non-slave-grown commodities, and using those details to help explain why it is that slave plantation in most, though not all instances, had significantly more emissions than non-slave grown agricultural labor in the early modern world. 
So let's start with the question. Um, in its most basic form, uh, what role did slavery play in the origins of anthropogenic, affecting human-induced or man-made climate change, right? The climate changes naturally, but what we're all interested in, most of us at least, is what we are doing to contribute to this natural phenomenon. And in a little bit more detail, and I'll explain more in my methodology, um, I take what is basically a carbon emissions approach. Uh, that is to say, I am interested in basically to the extent that we can say slavery did anything in terms of climate change, I think it's useful for us to be conversant a little bit in the basic methods of climate scientists. And much to my uh, surprise, a carbon emissions approach is not terribly difficult. Um, that is to say, if you're thinking about agricultural emissions, what you need to know is how much land did you clear, how much soil did you turn up, and how much carbon was in that forest and is in that soil. The difference between the two equals carbon emissions, right? Um, so once you figure out, uh, and again, I didn't figure that out on my own. I, I've been working, collaborating with um, a climate scientist who's been doing this for a while, uh, John Brook, as well as uh, two climate scientists who are really the leading experts on historical land use emissions, uh, Richard Houghton, uh, who's emeritus at uh, the Climate Woodwell Institute, and um, Jed O. Kaplan, uh, an associate professor at, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and then I hired a, I've been hiring a data scientist to help me do things that I'm incapable of doing on, you know, even Excel. It's even not that complicated. But the question, right, is let me, let, let's, let's keep this simple. Did slave plantations have more emissions than non-slave plantations in the early modern British Atlantic world, right? That is going to be my case study. And again, a hundred caveats that you guys can ask me about. Well, what about, well, what, we can talk about this. But this is a good model, a good case study through which to study. Did slave-grown plantations, the average size slave plantations, and did it differ by crop, rice, sugar, et cetera, have more or less emissions than non-slave-grown -slave, uh, slave plantations? That's looking at what I call the household level, the individual farm or plantation in a largely agrarian society, society of the 17th and 18th century, uh, before 19th century industrialization. And then the second major uh, uh, sort of um, emissions that, that um, I've been calculating is at the national level. And this you can largely tell through export data, well-known data sets that have been compiled uh, by economic historians um, in the 70s and 80s. And now digital, you can download the Excel file and get all the raw commodity exports. So you exported 1,000 pounds of tobacco. How much land would that have required? How much emissions did you have, right? You can do it for livestock. You, you, uh, what I'm researching here is Connecticut uh, was actually 75% of, um, of the horses that were shipped to uh, power the uh, the mills of uh, the sugar mills of of the West Indies came from the um, came from Connecticut. Therefore, how much land clearance did you need for those livestock? And therefore, what role did the northern colonies like Connecticut, but also the wheat that was exported to the West Indies from Pennsylvania? How much emissions did those emit from the export data? So um, that that way we can there, there's there's a northern piece to this story, the northern commodities, and I'm calling these the ghost emissions, right? You can't see them on the plantations in the sugar plantations, but those sugar plantations, because all their land is cleared for sugar, need to import timber, livestock, and wheat from the northern colonies, free farmers, uh, to power them. And that is, of course, part of the emission story of sugar plantations in particular in the British Atlantic context. As I have mentioned, this is a British Atlantic system. So think British Atlantic world, 13 American colonies, plus the 13 other Atlantic colonies, mainly the Caribbean, but also Canada. Uh, that's what I mean by British Atlantic system. Um, and in the first part of the book, I'm focusing on the major uh, slave-grown commodities of the colonial American period. So rice, tobacco, and um, sugar. And then the fourth, right, is those ghost emissions. So I'm combining, and this is what I'm I've uh, been researching here next month in the library company of Philadelphia, uh, the livestock, the, the farms that include livestock in the northern colonies, wheat in Pennsylvania, and timber, which is uh, also from uh, north, uh, northern trees. And can we convert that into emissions and then, it's, and then see what percentage of those timber, livestock, et cetera, is going uh, directly to the sugar plantations in the West Indies and get a sense of how large these plantations, uh, these plantation emissions were. And then in the 19th century, this is part two of the book, I'm looking at, at, at the kind of 
hot and coal nexus. That is to say, once in the 19th century, the major commodity becomes cotton. How much emissions are in those cotton at the individual plantation level? How do they compare to non-slave based farms, including the commercially oriented wheat and hog farms uh, in, in Ohio, in the, in the Ohio River Valley? All this I haven't researched yet, so I'm not going to speak much at all about that. I've only been focusing and have the data pretty much ready to go for the colonial period. But that's where this is going, right? Uh, looking at not only cotton emissions from uh, agriculture, but there, I believe, the critical story is going to be the ways in which English textile uh, firms are beginning to transition from water renewable energy, how they're powering their mills, you're by a river, the water's powering it. When you have this influx of cotton, they're very rapidly switching to coal power. That is to say, this is where the rapid transition in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s are happening in English, uh, or 1830s and 40s, uh, English uh, textile factories are switching from renewable energies to, um, uh, to coal-powered uh, steam engines in their factories. Not coincidentally, I'm, uh, I'm thinking, I have no proof of it yet, but not coincidentally because there's this influx of cotton coming. In that way, we might be able to say uh, and have some uh, proof that cotton slavery is a key transition in the shift to fossil fuels. Interventions. So the most important intervention uh, is, is just to think the big picture before I go through a little bit uh, more detail of what his, uh, hu humanists say and what scientists say. The idea that slavery may have played uh, a role in the origins of climate change is not new, as you'll see in a minute, but it remains a theoretical conjecture, right? Slavery equals capitalism, capitalism e equals climate change, therefore slavery must equal climate change. I'm being very simplistic, but the association, right, it is not difficult to make. And there are many humanists who are making these, these uh, conjectures as, I've, um, as I'll detail in a, in a second. But there's been no one's actually studied it in any significant detail, right? Sounds good, sounds plausible, but you know we need some proof. We need a way to test it. So that ultimately is what I'm trying to do, right? And I think that the evidence that I have goes some way in saying, you know what? There is a case to be made that slavery plays a role. And when I explain the argument, I will say what type of role it plays. So, uh, sorry, that was loud. Um, so the, um, the Anthropocene, uh, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, most of you may have heard of it, but where this whole, to the extent there, that there is a historiography, it exists more in the broadly speaking humanities, STS, science technology studies, black studies, um, geog radical geographers, uh, anthropologists, uh, historians, as I'll mention in a moment, are actually frustratingly absent from this debate, and I'm hoping to change that. Um, but this idea, scientists in 2000 have argued, right, that, you know, climate change is such a big deal, and this was before Al Gore, before everybody was talking about it. But scientists were saying, look, uh, climate change is significant enough big enough that I, I believe these are two scientists who are themselves not climate scientists, uh, say in a small scientific paper uh, that, you know what, I think that we deserve a new name for the, for the ecological or geological moment that we as a human species are in. And we're going to call it the Anthropocene. That is to say, human beings have now become the key drivers of planetary change, mainly through the mechanism of excess carbon uh, carbon emissions. We are changing the climate to such an extent that we are changing the entire biosphere. Everybody's lives, not only humans, but non-humans is at stake. The, the term catches like wildfire. Some of you may have met the sixth extinction, Pulitzer Prize winning New Yorker book by uh, Elizabeth Colbert, the climate science journalist for the New Yorker. She got the uh, the, 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 the word on, on my mind, but it's everywhere now. And it's again, uh, geologists are gonna decide one of these days whether they're gonna actually give it their, their vote of approval. Um, but about 10 years ago, even less than that, 2014, 2015, again, these, humanities, environmental humanities types began to critique this scientific term, the Anthropocene. And they said, you know, the problem with the term when it comes down to it is that by saying the Anthropocene, humans have caused planetary change, you obscure the histories of capitalism, racism, and colonialism. Well, me as a historian of slavery, kind of interested in these things. Me as a you know, for, you know, my leftist politics was peaked a little. Wait, well, maybe there is something going on here. Um, and and what, what can I do as a historian to actually engage in a little bit more concrete way rather than theorizing about it? So what all these humanities 
scholars have been doing, and they're and they're excellent. Donna Haraway, Jason Moore, uh, Andreas Malm. Some of you guys may have seen or heard of the book How to Blow Up a Pipeline. He's a radical geographer, right? Let's call it the capital of scene to highlight that it's really about capitalism and when the emergence of Western capitalism that we got to this moment. Let's call it the plantation of scene, says Donna Haraway and Anna Singh, the um, uh, the anthropologist. Right? Fascinating, great, really rich theoretical work. But since then, 2016, 2017, nothing doing. You know, exists in, in papers, but nobody's writing anything about this. So I figure, you know, this is an opportunity for me, uh, given my interest. Um, in slavery and as a, as a human being, um, racial injustice, of course, as well as uh, uh, climate change for all of us. Um, historians, of course, as I've just said, have been largely absent from this debate. To the extent that historians are writing about climate history, academic historians, they're doing great work, but unfortunately, it's not only not about slavery, with some notable exceptions, but it's about natural climate change. Some of the richest work, right? I'm thinking Sam White, uh, uh, Dagmar de Groot, right? How did the Little Ice Age and naturally occurring phenomena affect human events? This is what my colleagues, our colleagues, the historians here are doing. They're writing about how uh, the natural occurring climate change has affected you know, human events. They are writing about, um, about cultural perceptions of climate, how indigenous people uh, perceive the climate versus in Westerners people and how those influence the interaction between the two. They are writing about the development of climate science here at Yale. I should have reached out to her. She was one of my, uh, she taught one of my courses in grad school. Uh, Deborah Cohen wrote a beautiful book about uh, climate science um, in the Austro-Hungarian empire. Paul Sabin, who also teaches here, writes about recent political histories, the politics of climate change. Um, None of it is getting at the origins question, right? How did we get to here, right? It's very broad brush, capitalism, slavery, okay? And then we move on to the next, uh, to, to other things. But I wanna kind of sit with this, with this problem for a bit. And next I wanna talk about, about what uh, scientists are saying about the origins. It's important to know, you know, the New York Times and everybody else covers what geolog geologists are, are gonna say about climate change. I'm not gonna go into the details, but there are problems with geologists even claiming this, right? Uh, uh, claiming, uh, you know, the Anthropocene as theirs, right? It's not, this is, this is not a, a, geologists have one way of saying, is this really a geological era? And it's, again, I can talk some of the critiques about how they're going about proving it in, in many ways that have nothing to do with what they themselves know is really what's going on here. It's not about when we dropped a bomb and which is what they're probably gonna, gonna look to as the kind of marker, the, the golden spike of when, uh, of when you know, the humans began to change the geological record. Uh, it's about fossil fuels and it's about deforestation. They know that, but their methods in geology are very different and they have a certain standard about how they go about naming a new age that they and everybody knows isn't about the real cause of climate change, but it's a symbolic marker that they're looking for in the geological record. So once you realize that the geologists are you know, have their own standards, then you realize, wait a second, there's actually a pretty big scientific debate that extends beyond geologists about when this era begins. Uh, and one of the more interesting uh, ideas that's really important for my study, which is based on agricultural land use, at least in the colonial period, is William uh, Rudiman, I'm forgetting where he teaches, I think he's a retired now, but he's saying, look, if you want to know when human beings began to actually have a significant uh, increase in our carbon emissions, it's when we began which, with the birth of settled agriculture, roughly 5,000 to 8,000 years ago, right? So we're not even talking about capitalism, industrialization, slavery. We're talking about as soon as we stopped being hunter-gatherers and began settling agriculture and that system spread around the world, that's when it begins because we begin as a population to clear so much more forest. So that's theory one. Theory two, much more provocatively, and in my time period, some of you guys may have heard of it, newspapers have started to write about it, is, um, is this kind of American, uh, uh, American Indian uh, Holocaust. Basically, with the, uh, with the arrival of Europeans and warfare death colonization, the 90% population implosion of the indigenous population was so great, the population declines over a century by 90%, more or less, uh, that the trees regrow to replace them, and there's enough forest regrowth the, the size of the continent of France on the North and South, uh, South Americas to help explain the brief dip in the concentration of carbon, uh, of, um, of uh, carbon um, uh, PPM, right? The, the amount of carbon in a set amount of, uh, of air in the ice cores. In other words, trees are growing back, that they're sucking down so much carbon, and that has a very close correlation between the dip 
in uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, again, it's a correlation. It's a lot of indigenous people are dying. There must have been a lot of trees. And look, overlapping with that, the ice cores are telling us that there's also a lot of sucking down or dropping of greenhouse gas emissions, right? So this is another provocative theory. And it's the first time, according to these two geographers, that are saying humans, right, have begun to leave a record in the global greenhouse gas emissions. That's why it's significant. But of course, remember, that's global cooling. What most of us care about is global warming. When did we begin to release a heck ton of carbon into the atmosphere? Not when we not did not when did we begin to um, uh, uh, pull uh, greenhouse gases down. The most obvious, and I'll go this a little more quickly: uh, the Industrial Revolution. This is probably the most obvious theory, and this is saying. And again, this is Crutzen and Stormer, the guys who invented the term Anthropocene. And most his, his uh, scientists, when they're they don't really care about how far back, right? For good reason, they want to focus by what do we do now? I don't care when it starts or whatever. But the Industrial Revolution is just a convenient, as as Crutzen and Stormer, the Anthropocene people say, that's just a convenient marker. And they say that in the article. They say, look, 1784 is the invention of the coal-powered steam engine. The big story for the past 50 or even 75 years has been fossil fuels. And insofar as European economies began to be uh, become reliant on fossil fuels, well, a textbook, a, a, a sixth grade textbook tells us that that's the Industrial Revolution. And therefore, this whole thing begins with the Industrial Revolution. And let's just say 1784 is... Um, you know, the steam engine is a good symbolic start date. Of course, the problem with this theory is that as people who study global uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere know, it's really not until 1915, think about that, 1915, that actually the humans uh, emit a lot of carbon, again, mostly through deforestation in the, the recent human past. It's only in 1915 that, the, um, gre that uh, greenhouse gases, mainly coal and then a little bit of gas, uh, becomes the dominant human factor. So basically 100 years after the Industrial Revolution is when fossil fuels actually begin to be the dominant share of human greenhouse gas emissions. Before that, it's mostly um, deforestation, largely through um, uh, agriculture and commodities in this globalizing world economy. And then last, uh, climate scientists are most, or not climate scientists, geologists are most likely to say that the, the moment when we see a clear and, and, uh, and, irre and sort of irrevocable evidence of the uh, rise of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions at a uh, enormous rate is the decade or so after World War II. This is what the historian, one of the few to actually uh, engage with these issues, uh, J.R. McNeil, uh, popularized a few years ago with his book called The Great Acceleration. Um, and this is the idea that basically after World War II, there is a huge population boom. And simply to feed all those people, you're cutting down a hectare more forest. So that's one. Relatedly, with after the Cold War, I'm sorry, after World War II, you are seeing a rapid industrialization of all of the global South, where most of that population is happening. So both more population plus more carbon intensification, modernizing economies equals way more carbon emissions. And that's where we see, if anybody ever sees the Th this graph of when uh, P you know uh, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere begins to skyrocket, it's this hockey puck effect. After 1945, you know 1750, it begins a steady rise. Good for my story, but 1945, boom, skyrocket, right? And that is very obviously related. So these are the ways in which scientists are debating when do we say this story starts. So my argument is not that, look, it starts with slavery or slavery is the fundamental cause, but it is to say that, look, it does play an important role in the expansion of European empire's carbon footprint in a way that it will never return again. So this early modern, I'm making two arguments, part one, part two, think colonial versus 19th century. And part one, and I think I have now some evidence to, to, to prove it, and that's what I'll be talking about, is that early modern slave plantations significantly increased the rate of emissions in early modern European empires. Basically, with slave labor and with slave plantations, the average agricultural unit, including compared to wheat, wheat family farms in Pennsylvania, wheat family farms, 40% of their acreage is geared for overseas production. Let's call that capitalism, right? You are producing for a market rather than just for subsistence or your local economy. As soon as you begin to export for profit, we're going to call that merchant capitalism. 
Those wheat farms are producing 40% of their acreage is, do, is, uh, is, is uh, dedicated to commercial production, capitalist production. Well, slave plantations, every single one of them, more than, you know, more than doubles the emissions or roughly doubles the emissions in our models. And we're talking average size here, average size plantations. So clearly slave labor represents a dramatic increase in the rate of emissions of early modern European empires. And then as we'll see, when you look at the export emissions, it blows it out of the water. When you combine rice, sugar, and tobacco and comparison to wheat, and I don't have in this graph, but now I have it's also, again, I'll, I'll show you the graphs in, in a bit. It, it, just, it just destroys. Uh, it's clear that these slave grown commodities are significantly increasing the rate of emissions of the early British Atlantic uh, uh, Empire. And then again, this is conjecture at first, but based off of the secondary literature um, that, I, that I've read, it seems pretty clear that cotton is fueling this transition and uh, is fueling the transition to coal burning in English factories. Andreas Malm, one of these guys that's in the capitalism scene, makes a really interesting argument that actually it's about labor control and that, you know, the problem with water mills, uh, which, which was, you know, powering factories was that it gave basically workers too much power. It, it, it made um, it made them more, much more easy to strike. And industrial capitalists, uh, in, you know, use the new technology of coal and bring coal into the factories because they can, you know, surveil and control their, their labor much more uh, much more uh, powerfully than when they're spread out country, uh, across the countryside with these wet water powered uh, water powered mills. Very provocative, very interesting. But he totally ignores the question of slavery, which is interesting because he has a, a reference or two to cotton. Uh, and of course, we all know where that cotton is coming from. Seventy odd percent, whatever the, I'm blocking on the thing, of British imports of co cotton up into the Civil War are from American slave grown plantations. So I am going to look at if there's a way to say, look, the emissions from coal power uh, increases or doesn't um, as right we steal land from indigenous Americans in the 1830s and 40s uh, and ultimately replace all of that land in the deep south with slave plantations. Okay, taken together, this colonial and 19th century, the, the ultimate argument, at least to date, is if slave, plant, slave plantations were, if hardly the sole cause of climate change, then they were at least a key accelerant in the shift toward a more carbon intensive global economy. Uh, that is what I think is the biggest argument that I can make, uh, which is pretty big, um, off of uh, the data and the way that I'm approaching this. So as I mentioned, I've had collaborators. Now I'm going to discuss my methods. None of this would have been possible without John Brook, who forced uh, who recently retired from Ohio State, a climate historian, um, as well as these two other climate scientists, Richard Hoden, Jed Kaplan, and Deep Shaw, who I continue, continues to really do the number crunching with me. Um, so as I mentioned, right, this is a carbon-based approach. So the basic thing that you need to know, if we're thinking, so I should say one thing, for the fossil fuels, thank goodness, uh, climate scientists have already had that data. I don't need to do anything. It exists in various data sets, and I know how much emissions from coal there is in the British Empire. So I'm good with that. But the agricultural emissions, cotton, which I have not done yet, but all the colonial commodities, that's what I needed to figure out, right? Um, and basically what you need to know for agricultural land use emissions is, again, how much land is cleared, there is carbon stored in those trees. When those trees either are burnt or decay, release carbon into the atmosphere, right? Then, in addition, you have on top of that land your crops, and every single year you're either hoeing or plowing that soil. And every time you turn up the soil, carbon is emitted into the atmosphere because carbon is stored, uh, locked down in, in the soil. So those are the two main mechanisms through which land use modelers basically study land use emissions. There are other things that you need to know for the export model, right? There's a certain amount of exports every year, but you need to know the crop and field rotations. For example, if you're looking at change over time, you clear a tobacco field in year one. Well, what happens in year two? Every single year, are you clearing new land for that tobacco? Or as is the case, no, in tobacco, you basically plant the same amount of tobacco for three or four consecutive years. And then in year, let's say four, you have to clear another plot of land if you wanna grow the same amount of tobacco, continue to grow it for three years. On that land that you just left behind, you can use it for another three or four years for corn or wheat. And then in year seven, let's say three years tobacco, three years corn, you leave it fallow for 20 years. So you need to understand the land use patterns to build these land use models. 
Uh, but other ones don't, right? When you clear a tree for uh, you know, timber, although that's often coming from farms, right? It's cleared and that's gonna either become pasture or what have you. The other little nuance that I'll add uh, that, you, uh, that, that you need to know is when I'm looking at the household level, not the exports, but the household level, I need to know how much land was cleared for the entire farm or plantation. And therefore, as many historians who study this stuff know, it's not only the tobacco plant. In fact, that's often a minority of the land cleared. Most of it is cleared, depending on your period, uh, for livestock, pasture and meadows, as well as food to feed the workers, whether they're farmers, enslaved people, or the slave owners or uh, household owners. Right, so you need to know all these, uh, all the crops and their uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then quickly with regard to my sources for the individual plantations, um, I'm using the classic stuff that many historians, social historians and economic historians have cut their teeth on in the 70s and 80s. Account books, day books, journals, diaries and letters of the enslavers, farmers, merchants, slave narratives, right? Uh, all the stuff that gives me an understanding of how these people are using the land. And this, for example, right, this is very hard to read. This is the frustrating thing, but this is James Wilson's uh, featured in, in that article that I shared with, um, with the people in this room here. Um, this is a classic farm book, basically his daily schedule of how he worked his farm. And at the end of every single year, James, uh, James Wilson, which is the only existing farm book for a tobacco plantation that closely resembles the average size tobacco plantation, five to six labors versus the Thomas Jeffersons who have 200 you know, slaves. These, those are guys are irrelevant, okay? Those are the major ones. I'm not interested in the big guys. I'm interested in the, in the normal five to six enslaved people is the, is the average for the 18th century, broadly speaking. This tells us how much cattle he has, right? So at the end of the year, okay, if you have a farm that has 25 cattle and one cattle needs between four and five acres of cleared land, well then do the math. 25 times four equals 100 acres. You must have cleared at least 100 acres. Now there are nuances, right? Was all that cleared? Was that meadows? But if you keep everything equal across places, you can say, look, we're gonna assume that it's all cleared. Again, these are broad averages and I'm happy to discuss the nuances, but this is basically how you do it at the household level. Thankfully, I should say many historians have done the big population level stuff. So I don't need to go reinventing how many average number of slaves there were. People like Alan Kulikoff, Philip Morgan, all of those guys have uh, Gloria Maine, Lorena Walsh has been hugely connected. These historians have done all this basic work that I don't need to reinvent the wheel for all of this stuff. Similarly, the export data, right? This comes famously from census data. This is basically on the eve of the, of the American Revolution. Uh, the British famously are trying to say, you know, stamp back crisis, right? We want to keep track of how much stuff is going into your ports, how much stuff is going out. And they keep records for five years, the British National Archives, exports to the British and foreign West Indies from American ports, Newfoundland, Quebec, let's go down to where we are, New London, New Haven. This is telling us that you can't see this is 1770, there's for five different years, naval stores, tar, tobacco, what have you, New Haven, they are shipping 33 barrels of tar to the West Indies in this year, right? New Haven, this is 1770. Right. And so this data, thankfully, um, um, much of it has been compiled, but depending on my places, I need to go look at the individual ports. Right. Because now I'm interested in Connecticut. So I need to add up the Connecticut numbers. Lumber. Right. So keep in mind, this is th this one is only telling us where they sent stuff, where all these New England, uh, where all these uh, American colonies. But this is New Haven. Right. This is what I'm studying it, it, during this fellowship, the Connecticut colonies. And this is lumber. And there's ones for livestock and et cetera. Beautiful data set, right? And then you have to impute the data we're using when we don't have earlier data based on population, right? Uh, what's the population in 1770? What's the export, which is a crude measure, but again, a broad estimate going back to the population to 1700, et cetera. Um, that's how we're doing this. I'm not going to go through, like, th this is just an example of the actual raw Excel sheet. So I'm not going to, you're going to get uh, hate me if I go through all that. So let me just focus on the two key findings. Um, so what I want to focus on now, I have about 15 minutes left, is now walk you through the two main big takeaway findings and then focus on the individual, um, uh, uh, the, the two or three examples, comparing indentured tobacco to slave tobacco, um, slave tobacco to, to slave grown rice, and then wheat uh, to tobacco. So first is the big takeaway. This is the household level data. This is what I've been doing for the last year and a half, right? Finding the average size of, so what this basically tells you, everything green is slavery to just, if you just want to keep an eye shot, everything 
orange is non-slavery. So if you're looking at a green, you are looking at a slave plantation of some kind, whether it's, if you can't read it closely, this is a tobacco plantation growing only export uh, um, tobacco, five to six enslaved labor, uh, enslavers, this, uh, enslaved laborers. This one is in the 18th century, tobacco plantations begin to diversify into wheat. So in other words, they're not only growing tobacco, but also some wheat and corn. Corn is actually the bigger one. This is James Wilson, the, the closest model that we have uh, to an average you know, sized uh, tobacco plantation. He's also diversifying. This is rice. And then this is sugar, right? So clearly we see sugar plantations have a huge, uh, have a huge on the, on the individual plantation uh, level. Um, again, this is a combination of Barbadian and Jamaica. Uh, Barbadian sugar plantations are smaller than Jamaican ones, but this is the emissions over roughly 25 years. Um, and this here is New England family farm, right? Very little uh, export, mainly, mainly local exchange, a little bit of export uh, timber, what have you to the British West Indies. This is actually interesting. This is uh, mid-Atlantic wheat farms, which are commercially oriented. Think Ben Franklin, right? Pennsylvania, they're farming those German wheat farmers. 40% of that wheat is going shipped abroad. 50% uh, of that wheat, uh, dot, 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 is feeding the enslaved people in the Caribbean. People don't often raise that uh, fact where that wheat is going. And this is an indenture plantation uh, at their peak in uh, the late 1670s before the transition to slave labor. So clearly in all these instances, the emissions, right? This is measured in metric tons of carbon. Over 25 years, in all examples, slave plantations have more emissions. Okay, so how I write it. The, at the individual household level, the average size colonial slave plantation, regardless of crop, emitted significantly more carbon over the same time span than any other agriculture unit not dependent on slave labor. That's what these models of, again, average size, not the extremes, the average. Um, this second major data, right, is the export data that we have, again, for the colonial period. And I've actually now expanded this for the Northern, uh, and I'll explain that in a second. But again, green is slavery, orange is non-slavery, and gray is coal, British coal in particular, right? We're, all, we're staying within the British Empire. So what we're seeing here is that over 1701 to 1775, the eve of the American Revolution, tobacco exports plus those same slaves on that same tobacco plantation are, are growing grains. The combined emissions, the cumulative emissions over 75 years is 133 million metric tons of carbon. You can't call it widgets. I don't, just, okay, just, that's the number. 132 million. Rice is the interesting anomaly, as I'll explain in a minute. Why is that, right? That's where the story actually gets interesting. Sugar, right? Sugar, look at this. Tobacco, not, not as profitable, not as famous, but sugar actually has less than tobacco, right? For reasons that I think is really interesting. And this one combines all these three major crops, right? Sugar, tobacco, and rice over the 75 period when, slave, when the British Empire is fully invested in the slave-based system. Um, the export data, combining, doing all the land use, et cetera. Basically, slave-grown crops not only have more than northern-grown wheat, the largest emitter of northern, which is to say non-slave-grown agricultural commodities, right? Compare this 28 million to 233 million, but they also have more than British coal in the 18th century. Now, British coal will take up even more significantly in the 19th century as Britain begins to industrialize more, but already in the 18th century, British coal production is doubling over the course of the 18th century by capita and quadrupling. So they're still using a fair amount of coal, right? It's not the 19th century yet, but it just goes to show us that deforestation only for the crops alone, right, is 33% uh, higher than British coal emissions during the 18th century. That's significant, right? That's a big friggin' deal. And this doesn't include, right, all the other, right? This is just the, the land cleared for the tobacco. This isn't the household level that includes to feed the slaves to this, that, and the other, right? Um, and this, I should say, is uh, indenture era tobacco over a, over, over a similar 75 year period. This is showing us just change over time. This is John Brooke did this graph. Um, and the only thing that I would encourage you to look at is this orange line, which combines the three, everything green is slavery, everything orange is not. This is, right, so this thick uh, green combines one, tobacco, two, sugar, three, rice, again, the outlier. 
you combine it together and it's clear that around 1710, when this British system, uh, slave grown system, the three major commodities are coming into their own, begins to surpass coal emissions. That's the gray, coal emissions around 1710 and begins to dominate up until, I don't know when, I'm gonna find out in part two, stay tuned. Maybe David will give me a fellowship for that second part and we can, <laughs> and I can tell you where that story ends. Um, but uh, anyways, so, <laughs> So very um, now with, with the remaining, what I'm seeing as uh, eight minutes, let me walk through just a couple of examples, right? Um, this is what I wanted to uh, ask, you know, think about this. So why is an indentured tobacco slave plantation in colonial Chesapeake 17th century, which is basically is the, is the more or less 80 years before slavery for another 80 years in the Chesapeake, uh, tobacco growers are first using indentured labor, basically Europeans, you know, four to seven years contract, then you're free on your own. Slave plantations by the turn of the 18th century are turning to African slavery, and that system that develops in, the, in Barbados is now coming to the Chesapeake. Why do the average size tobacco slave tobacco plantation have twice the emissions than the average indenture, uh, indenture plantation? I think this example best capsulates, right, in a real historical example, how you can isolate the issue of slavery itself, because we're talking about the same crop, tobacco. We're talking about the same region. In other words, soil and geography don't matter. They will matter in other instances. And last, they're doing the same crop rotation. Three years tobacco, you put three years corn there, you cut down another every three years, you're cutting down more for tobacco, and then you let it rest for 20 years. Then by year 26, you can come back to that land. Indenture slavery, they're both doing the same thing, right? So it helps us isolate the role that racial slavery is playing. The only thing that's really different is the labor force. And the key thing, to understand why this is, is that slave plantations basically on average have twice the amount of labor, right? And this is interesting, think about it. I didn't say that uh, it's because slaves are worked twice as hard, it's because they're brutalized, of course they are. But the best data that we have, Lorena Walsh has been excellent on this, shows that the average slave is no more productive than the average indentured workforce, right? They're both clearing the same amount of land and expected to grow the same amount of tobacco. I was surprised by that, right? My instincts were, of course, you're, you're, you're you know, pushing them like crazy. That's unquestionably true, but at least the data that we have doesn't show that that's the answer. So really why we have double is because you have the same amount of people, uh, um, you have twice the amount of people and they're both clearing the same amount of land. And interestingly, I think the fundamental way to really understand this doubling of the labor force is gender. That is to say, as many of us know, during the indenture period, Europeans, fellow Europeans, women don't work in the fields, right? That's not what we do. Of course, there are exceptions, right? The poorest of the poor who can afford indentured are bringing in uh, an, an indentured woman. But by 1662, the uh, Virginia uh, uh, colonial uh, government famously gives a, basically a tax credit to tobacco planters and says, look, we will not, all laborers are taxed as our cattle. So if you have a son that's 16, he's taxed. If you have a slave, man or woman, she is taxed. If you have a white woman who's working out in, in the field, we are not going to tax you. So we want to incentivize you, right, to not put that woman in the field, right? We want you basically say what women should not be working in the field, right? And this is simply a reflection of the norms that why would you expect a woman to be out in the tobacco field? So there is a kind of acknowledgement that black women are going to be working in the field. And this is central to the understanding of the double, doubling of, of the labor force by the late um, by the late 18th century, black women and men on plantations are both working in the fields and their numbers reach parity. And that's not even when, uh, it's not until 1710 or so when slave labor really uh, becomes uh, uh, dominant in the Chesapeake. Um, so gender, I think, is, uh, it's the doubling of the labor force, but behind the doubling of the labor force, I think is this gender norm, right? Women don't go out in the field, uh, white women, black women uh, are forced into the field. The second example that I want to walk through very quickly is uh, why does slave grown rice, despite having six times as many laborers, right, have a much lower per capita emissions than, uh, than, um, than, than tobacco, than slave grown tobacco, uh, and similar for export emissions. So, right, we know that on the, in, uh, a tobacco plantation over, uh, a rice plantation over 25 years, 26 years, will emit more carbon than the average tobacco plantation. But if you divide by the number of workers, enslaved workers, Tobacco has three times as much, right? They're clearing a lot more land on the, on the tobacco plantations than they are on the rice plantations is what I'm trying to say. And you see that also reflected in the, um, in the uh, export data. 
7 million uh, over 75 years for rice, 133 million emissions for tobacco over uh, whatever, uh, over 75 years. Explanation, the plantation carbon complex. Not very creative, thank you, Philip Curtin. It's what I can come with for the time to write a word, right? The plantation car, uh, complex, right? I want us to understand, right? When we really understand the differences, especially between different plantations, right? That the plantation is not only a site of racial and, uh, and gendered exploitation, though it is fundamentally that, right? It is also a mixture of crop ecologies, of geographic constraints, of African and European agricultural knowledge, of enslaved resistance and capital requirements, right? These are social biological organisms, right? And therefore, once you break down these major component parts, you can really understand why rice, which has 35 enslaved laborers versus tobacco, which has five, why the tobacco has so much more, right? The most obvious in rice is crop ecology. Rice is non-exhaustive. You clear a field for rice, you can grow rice for 50 years, okay? That's huge. Tobacco, every three years, you're clearing more land. So while a tobacco plantation starts clearing much less land, over 25 years, it just blows it away because every three years, you're clearing land. So that's the crop ecology. African agricultural knowledge, right? It's not major, but I think it's important, right? It's not nothing. Historians debate, did Africans introduce, right? I'm not interested whether they introduced or not. The bottom line is that we have ample evidence that even the most critical historians, Philip Morgan and, and Eltis and, and et cetera, they acknowledge that, look, the advertisements are pretty clear, right? If you look at advertising in 1750 um, South Carolina Gazette, selling slaves, they know how to grow rice, right? Pretty clear. Clearly, they contributed to the ongoing commitment, right? The African ag ag agricultural knowledge contributed to the ongoing investment in rice labor. It was helpful to have a worker who's essentially trained in the methods of rice agriculture versus one that, you, as any good capitalist knows, right? Do you want someone with experience or without? I'll take the experience one, right? So I'm not arguing this. I'm not interested in the who started it. I'm, I'm interested in just pointing out that rice, the reason, if you're thinking about export data, Right. Well, they're not rice planters aren't getting out of this because they have a good workforce and it's working for them. Right. And that is part African knowledge are contributing to the ongoing commitment to slavery. So that's another factor. I don't want to overemphasize this, but I think we're silly to ignore it. In slave resistance, this is what's interesting. Many of us know the task system. This is basically, say, a unique labor management system uh, emerges, as many colonial historians will know. Task system, basically on rice plantations, unique to rice plantations. When you're, when you're done with your task, I'm being, I'm exaggerating here, go home, you know, go to your cabin, grow your crops, do what you want to do, right? Well, this is really important because if you look at at the household level, tobacco uh, 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 slaves are much more carefully managed. So what that essentially means is that you have more control over your slave's time. Therefore, once you're done with tobacco, well, you're gonna go into that corn flared and clear more land for corn. Versus rice, as soon as you're done with that rice, go home. So if you look at all the other, right, at the household level, there's far more land clearance for non-tobacco goods on a tobacco plantation versus the rice plantation where they're basically clearing for rice and a little garden plot. Oh, and by the way, slaves can eat some of the rice so they don't need those extra subsistence lands. You can't eat tobacco as far as I'm concerned, right? Those slaves need to grow eat corn, right? But it's this task system. And this is where resistance is important, right? Because we have ample records. Philip Morgan has showed this as well as other scholars that when planters try to violate the task system to squeeze more labor from their black workers, enslaved people resist. Therefore, it's more difficult to dislodge the task system because of, um, of enslaved resistance. And therefore, this is a contributing factor to less land cleared for rice plantations. It's a social organism. Geography, if we're looking at export data, rice to grow it for capitalist production, you need massive inundation of water. That needs to be close to the ocean. You are geographically constrained to the Eastern seaboard and in a particular climate. Tobacco by comparison can march inward up to the Piedmont thousands or hundreds and hundreds of miles, right? So basically tobacco can be grown in a much more wide variety, which means much more tobacco plantation, which means much more tobacco emissions. Right? So geography is coming to play a role. And I say capitalist production because you can grow rice in dry fields in the Piedmont if you're just growing little bits. A, a rain is enough. But if you want to grow a massive amount to feed a global economy, well, then you need massive amounts of waters. You need ditches. You need, you need dams. And I'll end it here. Uh, capital requirements. Again, it's all part of this plantation, uh, this system. And capital requirements, right? Look at what these African women, modern African women are doing, right? 
These are heavy, as we know, disease environments, rice plantations, right? The death rate is much higher, as what many of us know, in the Carolinas than it is in the tobacco slave plantation. Not because both systems aren't brutal, but because you're working in a rice plantation in this malarial-prone field where those enslaved laborers are dying much more quick, quickly. Well, not only is it more expensive to start a successful plantation to buy 30 enslaved laborers, but you need to replace them a lot more. Therefore, if you need to buy more slaves, you need more money. More money means less people are going to be able to do it, right? I call tobacco the most democratic crop, right? A, 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 you don't need to be rich to start a tobacco plantation or to buy a slave. One or two slaves will get you will get you going. And therefore, if you're a little bit successful, you can buy more over the course of your career. Rice, you got to start out strong. You go 20 or 30 slaves, and then you work your way up from there, right? And therefore, there's less export because the capital entry, which is tightly connected, right, to disease ecology, ecology, what I'm calling the plantation carbon complex, is very, uh, is all interwoven together. So this explains why rice from a uh, export uh, uh, standpoint has far less. There's simply, it's a harder game to get involved in if you're a planter capitalist. Um, I will end it there because of time. I won't go into wheat and I will just say to come back to my, oh, I had something for Frederick Douglass for you, um, but we'll save that for later. Uh, this data is not meant to suggest, <laughs> this data is not meant to suggest that slavery, right, caused our current uh, climate crisis, but I do believe it shows that racial slavery played a meaningful role in its origins, insofar as slave plantations stood at the root of a new capitalist world economy, we can now say, and with some evidence, that slave plantations accelerated the shift to a more carbon-intensive global economy. That's my talk. Sure, un unplug it. Um, you mean from the power or for the? Well, when we get oh. Yeah, but what about questions? So leave, you want me to leave? So unplug, unplug. Okay. 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 Online question. Okay. Have a seat. We're gonna okay. right, Daniel. Yeah. We're gonna okay. Um. Well, Eric. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Uh, rapid fire. Fascinating. Um. Can I just start, have you always been a data-based historian or is this a new adventure? This is a very new adventure, okay. which is- I hence, hope all, hence all your partners. Correct, correct. John Brooke didn't start as a data historian no, either. No, I didn't no. know. I mean, he does good old cultural- Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, but you must have a, you must have got that gene or instinct. <laughs> I, one day, a uh, former time, I was good at math, but it, it's a skill. I, I honestly, I, hope so. <laughs> I find myself uh, revisiting, right, how to do fractions with this thing. Um, you know, it's a skill yeah. that you lose and you gain. Yeah. So. Uh, gain and lose. Uh, are we okay or no? We're good. Okay. Okay. Sorry out there in online land. We're just making sure we're connected to you. We welcome your questions out there online. I believe you're sending them in. Michelle Zachs, our associate director, is upstairs processing them. Please send your questions. Let's start here in the room. Anyone among fellow fellows, uh, questions? I have more, but I don't need to go first. I already did go first. Yes? I just want to clarify what you may have said. Can they be heard? I don't know. No, okay. Oh, okay. I'll um, restate the question. You were adventured. Tobacco plantations to the ones run by enslaved labor. Mm. They're the same size. They're not the same they're size, the same and, and that's the key difference. That's why they're. Why, that's why tobacco. Let, slip, let's kind of repeat. Oh, I'm the question. sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Um. So, well, I cut. Is that the full your question? Or I, I guess I was just wondering if it the claim is that it's um because they're you know they have more intensive slave labor exploitation specifically black women on these enslaved plantations. How do you separate that from the fact that maybe enslaved owners just own more land than most people? It's actually, I, I may not have been clear that the actually, even though, look, you're enslaved for life, regardless of how many times you wield a whip, that's more exploitative, okay? Mm -hmm. But yes, there's certainly probably more violence. But my point is that there is no meaningful data to show that slaves are more productive. That is to say, they, so they actually, 
can clear the same amount of land, an indentured servant and a slave. There is no evidence to show that indenture um, that indenture you know uh, picks more uh, tobacco than an enslaved tobacco picker. That said, what there is evidence of is that tobacco plantations have twice the slave-based tobacco plantations have twice the amount of labor as indentured tobacco plantations. And that accounts for nearly all of the double emissions because think about it as a per capita, right? One person can clear uh, seven acres, two people can clear 14 acres. So that's essentially what's happening. It's not the, the while, while, while there is uh, literary evidence of violent exploitation, it doesn't bear, bear itself out in the productivity measures. So therefore, the real difference there is simply that slave plantations have twice the amount of labor and therefore twice the amount of land, is what, if what you're asking. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't that have something to do with the demographics of the slave trade versus an indentured trade? Of course. Yeah, because indentured slaves and it's all, are far fewer. And that's and, and the gender thing is they're huge. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's I think in the there the weren't first, many women among indentured servants. Right. It's yeah. 16 to 1, yeah. you know, white ma male to uh, female in the first year, first decades of the indenture. During slavery, it's two to one, yeah, yeah. women to men. Right. I mean, there, there's a willingness to, to use women in slavery yeah. that's not existent in the indenture period, yeah. which explains the doubling. Others, yes, please. This is so fascinating. Thank you so much um, for this talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions that are sort of closely related. So the first one is kind of a clarifying question. It seemed to me that the indenture examples were from the 17th century yeah. more, and then you have the 18th century slave planting examples. So isn't then time also a really important factor here? So I know hmm. we're controlling for everything like um, size and um, number and things like that. But time seems to be important in terms of developing techniques to sort of um, perfect the commodity extraction and things right. Um, right. That time we talked. So the first question is about time and chronology right. here and how that affects this story yeah. and, and the data. And then can we not experience from that mm -hmm. that just how indenture laid the groundwork? In some ways, as you mentioned, for the um, slave plantations, mm -hmm. the slave plantations are also then let lay the groundwork for something that is even more productive or more environmentally damaging to come in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So, is that what you're expecting in the 19th century data? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, what I absolutely. So, let me say, so should we repeat the question? Yeah, try in really brief terms. Yeah. And the second part of the question was, is this all going to increase in the 19th century because slave population is even larger? Cotton implied cotton plantations, even more land, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I suspect, yes, again, I, with the huge caveat that I've done no significant research into cotton or coal, but there is an argument that I'm, that I'm going to look into, which is to say, I mean, again, it's, it's kind of obvious. I, I don't know about the emissions part of it, but insofar as I'm going to connect cotton plantation and the acceleration of, or the expansion or increasing number of factories, well, yeah, I mean, not only are we getting, right, the, the cotton and coal is a nexus. They can't be understood independent of each other. And therefore, you're also exploiting more white workers, right, in the industrial field, in the, you know, in, in Manchester and what have you, mm -hmm. because they're also, yeah, we are, and then once slavery ends, right, as uh, Chris Manjarapara uh, says, I mean, I, I had, a, I didn't agree with his recent book, but, you know, he has another article where I think he's right, right, the idea of, of, of agrarian racial capitalism expands and forget about black, white, right? There are other forms of social divisions that are, if not race, race-like, right? That look at China, I just read a beautiful book by um, talking about uh, Japan and China, right? Well, the, the, the Japanese are exploiting in the coal fields uh, in, in 20th century Japan, the Chinese worker based off of ethnic divisions, right? It's, I'm not invested in this, you know- It's the story it, of the world. Right, it's the story of the world. But you know what, it just so happens that our world, right? Our type of economy, right? And, our, and, and the world that, uh, that, that we live in, right? Comes out of uh, this, this world. Um, I think. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so I thought this was great. You've already sort of calculated so much. And, and so I'm sorry to say my questions are about like other other things that you might yeah. come calculating, wondering if there are things you thought about. Yeah. Uh, so the first is I was thinking about the export market. And, and so in addition to everything else that you've shown. This is about the export market? Yeah. <laughs> my, my sense is that um, uh, the harvests of slave plantations were more likely to end up on a ship across the Atlantic than, like you said, things produced by a family farm yeah. that might be sold in a local market. Is there any way to measure the carbon emissions of that export process? You know, of course, 
Mm. We're not talking about fossil fuel yeah. ships, but but you know, there's a not yet. market to supply ships. There's lumber. There's the things that sailors eat. There's that just like absolutely time lag. Can you measure that? So I, that's obviously a, a big. I'm Most sorry. of the ship masts were built came from Maine and New yeah. England, or yeah, Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I do in this in the newer calculations that I have, I have ship buildings, right? How much ships yeah. were being built on a decade from all that? Bernard Balin has all these. There's all this wonderful data, right? And now, okay, I actually, that was quite hard. The timber was very difficult because they had to work with forestry people, which is to say, okay, we know that it's a 50 ton ship, but how much tons can you get out of a New England forest if we're assuming? And then you need to do all these weird calculations and they help me figure out the acreage for this sort of thing. But you're, you're hitting on, on something important. And I'm lucky that my defense, and you can call it a cop-out, is look, is this. Economic historian, that all the stuff that we're reading, I'm using their same data. And all these issues of, look, the um, economy is more than just what you're exporting, right? It's what you're trading from your, your local economy and all of the emissions that that might have entailed. And the argument is, yes, but it, that, is, that is not captured by this export data. And therefore, it is not the full GDP, if you will. It's not all the economic activity because, you know, I'm going to the market right here to buy a sandwich, but my, my real work is to make steel to ship to China, right? And no one's calculating the, the emissions from our, our sandwich making, right? The local economy. Yeah. And that's not captured by export data. So the best that I can say that is, well, you know what? The also truth, and this is what uh, many economic historians have said, who have used this to understand the British Atlantic economy, is saying, but you know what? That's also not capitalism, right? Local trade is the British are doing, you know, we, while most of these farms are subsistence, we all know that a significant amount of their, of their uh, economy is domestic. Like just to basically create their normal standard of living, he's buying from her and she, and they're all based in this little village, more or less. Capitalism is this long distance trade where, you're, where actually you're not producing for yourself, but you're producing for money profit that you can then use to buy other things. And that's not existing in the local exchange economy. So insofar as the export economy is the kind of embodiment of capitalist long distance trade geared towards not making an exchange economy, which is the local economy, but is geared towards profit and ultimately profit accumulation for the slave planters, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, then that's a good symbolic entry for capitalism and capitalistic commodities, right, are those that are being export. Local exchange has 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 emissions, but that's true in the Brit in the English countryside, too. Yeah, no, that's where I figured it would be much smaller. I was suddenly thinking of it. It seems like it'd be a way to maybe measure some emissions in something like rice, which might not have land use emissions, but say, oh, if all of this is ending up on ships and that's an emitting process, you might even see the difference become more there to get into the 19th century where, hey, you know, it's yep. massive, it's definitely capitalism, but it's more local and there might not be as much emitted in the process. Of Absolutely. And, and, and you can't see it because it's not quantified, yeah. right? See, yeah. So, there are problems here that I, particularly the 19th century problem where actually the data is in a way worse because there's so much domestic activity that isn't quantified whereas you know there's so much cotton activity uh, export activity that is quantified so that's something that i'm going to think through absolutely we're going to get questions online here any second on our left okay um q a oh um, there we oh, wow. where did they come um, can okay, I, <laughs> I can read them. Okay, I'm going to start with, I suppose, the first one. Or what well, you choo choo choose, choose the best. Maybe I oh, you should. Want David? Okay, there's, maybe I should. Uh, I think there's 12 total, and you can scroll through. Okay, I'm the curator. Well, this person is surprised by the apparent assumption that farms growing wheat, horses, and other livestock in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and so on, harvesting timber, were running on free labor. That's not true of Southern Rhode Island and a few other places it, in the yeah. North, she says. So, yeah. so there's, yeah. there is slave labor yeah. being used, not on yeah. the scale, but in the North as well. Yes. Is that part of the study? I don't um, know. Yes, I would say. So uh, I'm going to talk to um, Betsy. So should we? Should we... Sure, you can use okay, their names. So, put their um, names, you can use their names. Um, <laughs> uh, Betsy uh, Kasdan had a uh, excellent the first question reading. And her question for those listening is, I'm surprised at the apparent assumption that farms growing wheat horses and other livestock in Connecticut and Rhode Island harvesting timber were running on, quote, free labor. By that, I mean mostly family labor. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she goes on to say that's not true of Southern Rhode Island or Pennsylvania in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Does enslaved labor in the northern colonies change and maybe enhance your argument? So my argument there is, yes, there is certainly enslaved labor at work on these farms. But if you look at the percentages on the population level, they are minuscule. 
I am very somebody who is very much invested in understanding the implications of Northern slavery. Mm -hmm. But when you start to look at the, go back to these economic historians, I think we begin to recalibrate our understanding of where slavery is meaningful from a agricultural and capitalist production standpoint and where it's not. That's not to deny the significance of, so uh, this is a great example. Um, right now I'm looking at livestock. So I, I'm assuming that that um, Betsy might be, or uh, Professor Kasdan might be thinking about uh, Narragansett is famous mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. uh, horse growing and exporting many of those horses to the West Indies. The truth is there's not nearly as many as many horses as Connecticut, which is dominated by family farms that does not rely on slave labor in any significant way. The wealthiest always have slave labor, but the general narrative still holds. In the North, slavery is fundamentally a luxury item that you use for household stable and maybe the wealthiest farm owners, right? The Narragansett exception, but 75% of horses, which by the way, so there's Narragansett horse farms are using enslaved labor. They look like South Carolina plantations, right? But in Connecticut, it's people, a farm of 100 acres with six or seven uh, uh, slaves, only the wealthiest 25% may own one slave for 10 years in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. 6% of colonial Connecticut owns those farm, farmers own slave plantation. That's from uh, Jackson Turner, Maine here. The point is, again, it's significant, but not in, in, in these ways. Um, I think, sorry, I'll end it there. No, it's great. Well, here's a big one for you. Uh, yeah. You can choose or not. It's from an anonymous attendee. Yeah. Uh, would this seem to imply that there is a reparations component to the concept of environmental justice? <laughs> that it's not just about who was impacted by climate, carbon change, et cetera, but about who was exploited and the method by which it accelerated. Has this appeared anywhere in this broad discourse? Uh, There's certainly- um, Environmental misuse leads to a, a repair issue. I am, I am of the school of thought, at least for this current project, given that it's potentially inflammatory, everyone's gonna, and, and my colleagues will probably be the most jump down my throats about very legitimate questions that they have. Well, what about, right? Mm -hmm. But I will say, I think we as historians do our best work when we say, listen, you hear what I'm saying, do with it what you want. In other words, That's I'm going answer. to trust you that if I am saying that slavery matters a lot for climate change, listen, activists, listen, policy journalism, you go use my book and make that argument. But if I frame my book as, Therefore, we need climate justice. I have pretty sure that for most people, it's a dead on arrival. Therefore, listen, it's understood what the political implications are or could be. And I am much more happier playing the role of historian and putting my authority behind that than I am of saying, therefore, we need X, Y, and Z. But by the way, when I'm a citizen, hell yeah. Right. Hell yeah. But the Barbadian, the Barbadian politician uh, who's leading the reparations. Right. I don't know if you guys know about. Right. Hell yeah. yeah. But this book isn't going to be making that case. Right. Fair enough. Uh, well, there's a lot of questions here about the north. Yeah. Uh, as though you were leaving that out, yeah. I guess. But uh, let's see here. Uh, they can overlap each other. Are you familiar with the work of ethnobiologist Jane Mount Pleasant? Yeah. Okay, well, good. So who compares the indigenous, the indigenous complex of the three sisters with European farming and the drop in production in the Journal of Ethnobiology? You know that stuff. Yes, not only do I know it, I, I've, um, in, I, so a lot of the colonial stuff is, is out for peer review in an article that I, again, I shared with the people in the room. Um, and one of the reviewers mentioned this article. And for, for, uh, for part of the uh, article, when I'm dealing with starting with Colonial Virginia, right, I'm comparing the land use emissions um, of uh, the indigenous population in the Chesapeake on arrival to the European uh, um, indenture servant that's going to replace it. Mm -hmm. And again, lo and behold, it is not significant, right? In terms, I'm sorry, what I mean is indenture, indenture plant tobacco plantations- That's why you do the numbers, right? Right, have far more emissions than the indigenous plantation. Now this isn't, I'm not making, right, the indigenous people in love with nature, right? I'm just saying like at the end of the day, okay, at the end of the day, how much land are they clearing for their crops and their animals? Yeah. And how much are they not? And lo and behold, when indentures are doing more, it's not only slavery, and then slavery are doing twice an indenture. Yeah. Right. So it's about this is my argument. It's not that these things aren't, you know, but this is what happens when you start to deal with some of the, the big picture numbers. It's your your sense of what matters and doesn't 
becomes a little different. It's really about deforestation and, and ultimately the use of fossil fuels. For, I mean, yes. When you get, especially yeah. in the 19th And this century. is true, and the, you know, this is true uh, uh, throughout the 19th century, including industrializing people. There's a lot of, you know, the steamboats I'm realizing uh, before the Civil War, which caught in, you know, are going, this is, I think this will be the third of part two chapter. It's mm -hmm. coal, caught in, but also the transportation. Yeah. And steam engines um, are not being, in America at least, are not being powered uh, by coal, they're being piled by wood, and it's yeah. a heck ton of wood yeah. to power those coal, uh, those those steamboat engines to bring the cotton down. Right. So one of the things that I'm contemplating for a seven or you know a seven chapter mm -hmm. is calculating the emissions of steamboats that are fueling, uh, that are transporting the cotton down to the port of New Orleans and ultimately to the English textiles. There are a couple of questions here too, and you don't have to take yeah. this. Our, our good friend uh, Adrian Van Dyke wants to know about reconstruction and peonage, but you're not there yet. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Adi. Anyway, I have a final question, if we, if I may. Years and years ago, there were a group of historians. I remember one of them by name, Norman Riss George, Riss, Riss George, who, Riss George, excuse me, he was one of my teachers in graduate school. But there was this whole cluster of historians arguing that land use on the eastern seaboard had been such that the land was used up. It was the old used up land theory. Yeah for not only westward expansion, yeah. but for slave expansion. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so. And, and, and so I guess the question is, does your research yet, maybe the data doesn't, but does the research yet produce any information about awareness? Right. Awareness. What do people think about, right? Do they, are they aware that if you clear another 100 acres of land, you're doing something here? Is there an awareness? Absolutely. Okay. See, that's interesting. That means so, they kind of know what they're doing, but not like we do. Are right. Well, the, well they, they have different understandings of what's the effect. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So the two things that I'll say about this, and again, here I'm drawing on. You remember that old literature, though? I, I mean, I, yeah, they, Avery O'Craven is, yeah, is, is the first guy to say. That's the 1930s. Yeah, yeah. But he was the first guy to say, look, like the theory of, of slavery expansion is soil exhaustion. Yeah. That's soil what exhaustion. Saying, right? you, a you, whole. You do, Batch of like books he was a racist right. and terrible, but yeah. you know, he got one thing yeah. right. You and know? a Quaker. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, again, he is doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But the point, right, is that you know, you know, the staple, and yes, yeah, so famously, right, these agricultural improvement societies, right? This is what James Madison and George mm -hmm. Washington mm -hmm. are all about. And they're trying to figure out, listen, we can't afford to keep expanding, right? Yeah. We're butting up against indigenous people, and that's creating conflict. Right. And right, this is too expensive. We've got to import more slaves. And we got to import more and slaves. And they want in the slave trade. But, and, then, yeah. and land use. I mean, so, but that's interesting because today we're all about awareness of yeah. climate. Well, right? the awareness, Persuasion. the awareness is, is, you know, amongst the improving elite people, the people who are reading, uh -huh. they're clear, which is a small elite, but they, they dominate the kind of public, the, the, the published sphere. In the 1770s and 80s, all the big, you know, the, the Jeffersons, Tom Jefferson is probably the most famous one, are saying, look, we need to get away from tobacco. It is exhausting the right. soil. That's what we, notes on the state of Virginia is it, part about. That's exactly right? it's a it's an a agricultural treaty. So so the question is, are they they're they're not thinking of climate, but mm -hmm. they are thinking of look, how do I stay put? This isn't feasible for me to have to move every ten years because I've exhausted my soil. So how can we? I'll still buy Louisiana, that? but that's you know that's another story. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about this is this is the fascinating thing. And here I have to say who I'm drawing on. But, you know, Richard Grove, some of you guys may know Green Imperialism, um, and Mark Stewart, uh, one of the early, from the 90s, historians of, of slavery and the environment. Um, and that's, you know, sugar planters are, you know, what, what Mark Stewart called green paternalists. <laughs> and that was his way of saying hmm. stewards of the land that were patriarchal slave owners. And that is to say sugar plantations, for yeah. reasons that I didn't discuss here, rapidly clear all the, all the land because they're confined by the land mass and much of it is good for sugar cane. And they realize, crap. How are we going to continue to grow sugar if we're pushed off our own island? Right. So they begin right. to create environment sustainable agriculture. What right. do they do? Instead of using wood to distill the sugar, right? You got to burn wood to sugar cane juice is in a vat. You got to burn a lot of wood to do it. Let's use, um, let's invent a, a new technology, the Jamaica train right. that basically reduces the amount of sugar. Let's start importing timber from our backyard right up here. Right. And more importantly, for the sugar mills, let's start using windmills, which is right. in Barbados, right. renewable energy, right? So they are thinking about ways to conserve natural resources while maintaining slavery and all the to profitability. To production. To produce slavery growth. and profit. 
Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so you know, uh, environmental solutions therefore are not are not the purview of, of good lefties. No, is, no, no, is no. the point. And the South eventually has loads. I, I, I know what you're going to say. Liberals and no, all their. No, no. Uh, which one, Mark Stewart? Yeah. It's one of those quotation titles that I, you know, what will grow old and blah blah blah. You know, I'll, I'll give it to you. Georgia <laughs> plantation. I'll give it to you. Yeah. Oh well. Hey. Wow. Uh, any final questions in the room? Or from out in yeah, we have a lot land. of online. Oh ones. my god, yeah. Oh, we do. Uh, can't get to all of them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, anyway, uh, Eric, this is fascinating. Uh, yeah, we're going to have you back another year to do the 19th century. Why not? We got to know. You know. Uh, but I. This. It's fascinating that this actually has led you even to the question of how. Even 18th century people were thinking about sustaining what they do. They had to. Yeah, absolutely. They, they know they live absolutely. in a world where this cannot the be sustained. Resources are finite. Yeah. But they never stopped believing that slavery could be sustained until they had to. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming online. And thanks to all the fellows in the room.